21-year-old student Scott Macklem lay dead by his car. Five months later, a jury found this man, Frederick Freeman, guilty of the murder and, at the age of 25, he was sentenced to life in prison. Prosecutors claim Fred Freeman, a martial arts expert, is a dangerous criminal. He's been called the ninja murderer. He claims he's serving time for a murder he did not commit. The suspect claimed he was some 450 miles away at the time, but was never given a polygraph. It wasn't until about four or five months into the jail thing that I really realized I was being framed for murder. These police reports started to come in and it was just like lie after lie after lie. Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. And I should also say, welcome to an episode of One Minute Remaining, because today, in the studio, I have with me Jack Lawrence. Jack's a journalist and host of the outstanding true crime podcast, One Minute Remaining, where he talks to prisoners in America. We're going to do a collaboration of sorts, discussing all things crimes. We'll hear about Wild Bill, a contract killer who's incarcerated in one of the world's worst prisons. We'll hear about people who have been wrongly convicted, and about the teenage brothers who were found guilty of murder and grew up in an adult's prison. Some of these cases really should be in Hollywood movies. I think I can speak for the I Catch Killers listeners. They're going to enjoy Jack's insight into a lot of things, and in particular crime in the United States. You're going to enjoy. The I Catch Killers podcast was a fresh start for me, as I left policing behind and started a new life. Over the years, we've laughed together, cried, and shared some powerful moments. Welcome to I Catch Killers. Jack Lawrence, welcome to I Catch Killers. Gary, lovely to be here. And firstly, can I say thank you for calling me a journalist? Well, uh, I'm sure there's real journalists out there that would be rolling their eyes at that comment, but uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, in a broad scope of things, we'll call you a journalist. Sure, you're telling, I'll take you're, it. You're telling stories. You're delving into people's lives. Yep, so absolutely. Is it a tag you don't want to be well, tagged no, with? No, absolutely. I mean, I, I I never want to be tagged with investigative journalist because I feel pressure. that that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And I've never claimed to be an investigative journalist. I'm a former radio DJ who played Taylor Swift and gave away <laughs> pink tickets. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I'm not an investigative journalist, but I am someone who enjoys telling because uh, some of the good investigative journalists, they do set a high bar, don't they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you just have to look at some of the podcasts with amazing investigative journalists who have uncovered, you know, incredible things. Yeah, yeah. Where, you know, we're, I don't. We're, we've had uh, Headley Thomas on uh, ah, well, on the podcast. Royalty. And, yeah. And when you sit and speak, and it's just humbling speaking to someone like Headley with the, the things that he's achieved. Yeah. Through. I mean, I can only dream that my show would do half of what his has achieved to do. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's certainly got a career he could be very proud of. <laughs> yeah. Now- one minute remaining. Mm. I, uh, I I've listened to uh, a number of episodes on the podcast on the one minute remaining. You're the creator, the host, and all that. Mm. First of all, the name. How did you come up with the name? Cannot take credit for that whatsoever. A friend of mine. You're who, very, you're yeah. very humble. Yeah, yeah no, I, I cannot. Dismissive. I cannot. Do you take, do anything? Yeah, no. It's all a ruse. It's all AI, actually. <laughs> all right. Uh, no, uh, a good friend of mine who's a, a photographer, actually, who's an avid podcast listener, uh, Gareth Lewis. He, um, he, I sent him the podcast before it came out, and I said, "Mate, I'm struggling with a name," and I was going to come up with something flowery like Injustice or you know something yeah. like that. And he listened, and it. When I'm talking to the men and women who are incarcerated, they get a certain amount of time. Yeah. And then after the, when you've got one minute left, a voice comes on going, you've got one minute remaining. Yeah. And he goes, mate, the name of the show is in the, you know, is in there. It's one minute remaining. Yeah. And I went, oh, it's genius. Cause it's got so many connotations, you know, when, especially a lot of people I'm talking to, they're on their last minute. Yeah. So speak, I, I you know? like it. And it, it certainly meant something to me because mm. I know my career in policing, uh, quite often I'd be getting calls from the, the jail and the, the pre-record that this call is going to yeah. be recorded. Are you prepared to take the call? Blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. I'm thinking, okay, which bad guy inside wants to talk to me this time? Yeah. And I, I'd get constant call, calls like that. And then you, you get told when the call's about to be cut off. So yeah, yeah it, it res resonated with me. With um, i, I got to say with the I Catch Killers, it, it wasn't too creative in coming up with the name there. Um, I was a homicide detective. What uh, I... I catch killers. Well, does what <laughs> yeah. it says on the tin, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. that, that, it's, so, I mean, it's look. It, I mean, can I just firstly say that? I mean, you know, I listened to your podcast when I was in radio years and years and years ago when it first started. Yeah. Uh, and you know what you have done is just you know for someone who wasn't in radio or doesn't have that background, um, I think it's just you know it's phenomenal what what I catch killers have done and some of the people you've spoken to. You know, there's so many interviews you've done that I sort of still think about now. Yeah. Um, well, th thanks for that, and I appreciate you saying that because I, I consider myself very fortunate to be able to be in this position and speak to some people with some amazing stories. Yeah. And quite sometimes I walk out of here and I'm kicking stones thinking, hmm, I wish I, I've done nothing with my life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, I know. They're inspiring know. people. Incredible, but yeah. 
I, I've <coughs> got to say, I learned something from everyone I've had in here. Mm. It, it doesn't matter what they've achieved in life or their low points, how they came out of the low points. And uh, it's quite interesting when you sit down and have a conversation with someone and learn a little bit about them, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I, I've always said that, you know, I think everyone's got a story. It doesn't matter, yeah. you know, people say, oh, there's nothing interesting about me. But when you actually talk to them, what they don't think is interesting, you say, well, hold on a second, that's incredible. You know, and I think, you know, especially with one minute remaining, when I talk to these men and women who are incarcerated, I never wanted to just say, let's get to the gory details. What yeah. happened? You know, the murder and all the rest of it. And tell me about jail and shankings. Yeah. I wanted to go back and go, how did you even get here? Um, you know, how did, wh- where, what did, where was your life? So we always start from the very beginning of their life. Uh, and work our way up until the point, obviously, they found themselves in, in, in trouble. It, it <clears> works <throat> for me because I, you can have the most dramatic incident or event that can occur. But if you can't put it in context with the type of person that's been through that, it loses some of it. It, it, it sort of glorifies or it's dramatic, but you don't fully understand it. And that's what uh, that's what I like about podcasting is that uh, – because I've, I've done some other work in uh, you know, various fields in journalism or as a police officer doing the stand-up you know, in front of, front of the cameras. Mm. And it's just that snippet, that grab that they, you can't really grasp the full story. Oh, totally. And I think we'll probably talk about that as we go on because I think, you know, I, I have a very big, and I, obviously everything I talk about, I just want to preface that I'm very heavily United States based. I'm not, this isn't directed at Australia or yeah. Australian media, but I know in America, trial by media is just insane. And as you said, those yeah. little snippets that go out and then it becomes the story and then, and that's all you know. And, you know, there's a story I've just covered about two young blokes who have been incarcerated since they were 15 and 16. They were for murder. Yeah. And all the town or the area that they came from in Alabama knew was that these two bashed to death a, a loving family man from the community, and and that was it. Yeah. The, the, the headlines of these awful teenagers who bashed this family man. And I, once you dig a bit deeper, and you actually find out, you know, the ins and outs of the guy who died. In you know, again, not saying that he deserved what he got, but yeah. when you look at what the prosecution put across that this was a loving family man who was just trying to, you know, calm a situation down, and these awful people bashed him to death. Yeah. When you look at his past and his history, what the kids has always said happened becomes more like, well, actually, that could exactly be what happened. Uh, and I, I, that community, it's incredible. Like, actually, that, that Alabama is our biggest audience in the United States yeah. because this community has heard that story and gone, wow, we didn't know any of this. Like, our mind, you know, I've had people listening going, I hate these boys. You know, I'm going to listen to this with an open mind and, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm not interested. You know, they, they listen to it and then completely, you know, the, the main lady who sort of started it all started hashtagging free the canes because she's like, my whole life was a lie, what I was told. There's, there's so much power in the media for the story to be told and, and, and the beauty of covering it in a podcast situation we're not bound by the narrative that, uh, yeah, uh, let's say the police, and we'll take it away just from the New South Wales police, so I'm not just sitting here, here kicking them. Yeah. But police will release a narrative that comes out, media pick up, with it, run with it, and that's the narrative that play, plays throughout, and it makes it very hard to shift people's minds. I found it interesting when I was in the cops that uh, people would read the headlines and they would just jump on the headlines. Now, whether the headlines, I'm not just saying with the papers, it could be the headline on, on the nightly news or you know, the, the radio news, news clip. And they'd make their own interpretation about what's happened with the crime. Mm. I'm working on the crime. And I, I'd sort of think you, you're missing the point entirely. Mm. And it's just one snippet. It can be one headline that changes the whole, not everyone. Some people are more critical thinking in the way that they look at the news that's presented. But they just run with the narrative mm. and it's very hard to change it. And you see it a lot. You know, you speak of that headline and people only just, you know, going off the headlines. And at the end of the day, news like anything is about getting eyes and, and ears and everything on your site and on yeah. your organisation. And how do we do that in this world where, you know, TikTok is such a huge thing because it's short and it's sharp and it's to the point. Headlines. Headlines get people to click through. It's clickbait, yeah. you know, no matter what you're talking about. So, And unfortunately, as you said, people read those headlines but don't actually read the full story. And once you actually read the full story, you're like, oh, well, it's, it's not quite that's not quite the story. There's a lot more to <laughs> it. A little um, bit more depth there and a little bit more nuances that totally. uh, we don't under, understand. Absolutely. I, I, I And this is just speculation on my behalf. I think that's why people, uh, like podcasting has just grown exponentially you know, yeah. from uh, what it was five years ago to where it is now and it, it seems to be continuing to grow. I think people have got an appetite for the bigger story. Mm. Like we all get stuck on our phones looking at TikTok or Instagram or, or whatever, but podcast allows you to delve deep into mm. the story yeah. and, and find out a little bit more. Have you found that, you know, having anyone on your show that once you've actually you had a perceived 
opinion about someone and then they come on and you've heard their story and you've gone, your mind's completely changed. Yeah, <coughs> mo most definitely. Um, probably, and this is, this is my, um, yeah, uh, my bias as it comes with being a police officer mm. for as long as I, I was. There were some crooks that, yeah, I, I spent my career chasing these people that now come in on its guests as podcasts or they're at a level that I'm, I'm looking to them. It was like, you know, they're the Ned Kelly of our, our time, the yeah. major league gangsters, bikies and that type of thing. It's quite interesting sitting down and hearing their story and thinking, Jesus, if I went down that path they did in their early stages in life, maybe I would have turned out that way. Mm. And it, it's quite, uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. And I, I check myself a lot and I, I use this quite often because it's something that's really resonated with me. I work very closely with uh, Dr. Sarah Yule, which is a, uh, she was a criminal psychologist with the New South Wales police and I'd work with her on the investigations. Uh, and uh, I'd bring her in on the tough investigations where I just wanted a different perspective from, mm. you know, the, 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 the vision or, or looking at it from a detective's point of view. Let's have a psychologist look at it. And she was great assistance. I, I worked with her for a very long time throughout my career. She was always at pains to tell me just because someone's done a bad thing doesn't necessarily make them a bad person. Mm. And, you know, when she said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What, whatever, <laughs> yeah. Sarah, you know, psychologist. Yeah. I'm the cop, you're yeah, the psychologist. Yeah, yeah. But the more I, I think about it, the more I reflect on it, she's quite, quite right. And it's cha changed my view on things. So yeah, the guests that come on and finding out their stories and also people that I've, I've, I've looked up to and I, I get a sense of why I look up to them. I, we, we mentioned Hedley Thomas at, at the start. Yeah, mm -hmm. no one that's got a curiosity about news, crime <clears throat> or whatever could not have been, you know, have a view about Hedley. Understanding the depth that he would go, he lived and breathed these uh, these inquiries or investigations, these stories he was looking at, and you walk away and go, "Wow, impressive, uh, impressive person." Oh yeah, without a doubt. As I said at the start, I mean, if my my show could do anywhere near what his has done, which it probably it won't, because I don't obviously delve into it like he does on, on one particular case. But it's just incredible what he's done. And other, there's plenty of other podcasts out there that yeah. have proven that you know that they've delved deep and they've found truth. You know, there's a podcast called Proof. Um, who helped him releasing two gentlemen from prison. Yeah. Um, you know, even a guy on my show, I mean, I will never take credit for him being released, but he spent uh, over 40 years in prison for a murder that he always said he, um, he didn't do. And I started talking to him while he was still incarcerated and he was still fighting to be free. Um, and, you know, just listening to his story and what had happened, like I'm going, you know, people, there's so many people that, still think this guy is a murderer at 15 yeah. years old. He shot, he was apparently shot someone in the head. He was just a stone cold killer was put into an adult prison at 15. He had to grow up in the system. Yeah. Um, and just such a lovely human being. And he told me his story and where he came from and all this sort of stuff. And not, not a choir boy, mm. but you know, not a killer. Um, and he was eventually released, you know, he was exonerated, uh, last year completely of the crime. Um, and it just goes to show, and that's, again, with my podcast, there's a lot of people that don't agree with what I do yeah. uh, and my show because I speak to people who are incarcerated and have been found guilty. Yeah. But with the United States, the rate of wrongful convictions alone is just so astronomical. It's scary that the uh, system the system can get it wrong. Yeah. If you enjoy this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to True Crime Australia. If you haven't already, click the bell icon to stay updated on all our latest content. I know in our conversations before we sat down here, you, you've talked about the, the concern that uh, you're having people that are, you know, the, the majority of your guests are in prison. They've been you know, convicted of uh, yep. ser serious crimes. Yep. And, uh, you know, uh, are you being uh, soft here? Are you being, what a bleeding heart? Uh, these people mm. have done bad <clears throat> things. They should be in jail. I felt a little bit the same way. The first series of I Catch Killers was very much focused on police investigations, yep. like uh, get in ex-works colleagues and talk about, yeah, we did this and did that and some of the high-profile crimes that they were running and uh, and managed to catch the person responsible. And then I thought, well, that, that's got a shelf life. Like we can't, I, I'd get bored with hearing that every, every day. I, I want to look at, and I knew crime was more than one dimensional yeah. from a police point of view. <clears throat> Good guy, bad guy, you go to jail that there was a lot more. And so then I started doing uh, people that have been convicted of very serious crimes, murderers, armed robbers, escapees, the whole, whole range of things. And I was thinking, it, what's the pushback going to be? Why am I giving mm. this this notorious <clears throat> gangland hit, uh, you know, standover man time on there to, to talk? But that's what I like about podcasting. I'd be interested in your point of view. I feel my role as a host of a podcast, if I get a let's say, a controversial guest on or a guest that you know, the majority of people wouldn't like. My view is you form your own opinion. Yeah. 
I, I'm going to give this person time. I'll, I'll give him the platform is the podcast. They can tell their story. And let's let the listeners be, uh, give them enough credit that they can form their own view. Now, if I'm sitting here talking, like people thought when I get a, a, a crook in, a, a bad guy, I might sit here and the old detective back will come back mm. in me and I'll be trying Stop to know. Them, them, oh, that's yeah. bullshit. You yeah, say yeah. this, but that didn't happen. Yeah. This. Let's hear their story, mm. give them a, a, their, their side of things, and let people judge for themselves. Yeah. I mean, that has literally from day one, if you listen to episode on my show, but the first thing I say is, I'm not here to try and prove anyone innocent or guilty. That is not what I'm here to do. Yeah. I'm here to allow people the chance to speak who generally haven't had the chance to speak. You know, whenever someone's arrested and they go to court, you know, the, the, generally, the, you know, if the crime's big enough, it'll be in the media. They yeah. don't have to, they get to get yeah. to respond to those allegations or anything like that. Yeah. They go to court and they're tried. You don't generally get to speak. You know, you're told to shut up, let the lawyers handle it. You know, yeah. all these people sit there, their life is on the line and they have to be quiet, say nothing. Yeah. Don't smile, don't cry, don't show any emotion. Just sit, look at the camera. And then they get found guilty and they've not told their story. Yeah. Now, as I've said to the, the beginning, I don't think everyone I talk to is innocent. Of course, you yeah. know, it's, I wasn't even planning on talking to people who said they're innocent. It's just swayed that way. You know, the majority of people I speak to say they're innocent of the crimes they've been committed, uh, convicted of. So it was never supposed to be a wrongful conviction podcast. It was just hearing these people's stories yeah. and letting people, as you said, make up their own mind. And I say that from the start, you know, you, you know, they call them, my, my listeners are the OMR jury, you know, yeah. they're jury members because maybe one day they might be and yeah. they will have to listen to stories and, and evidence and, and make up their own minds and, and guilt or innocence. And, and for, form their own view. Yeah. And like, well, I, I know we've, uh, the I Catch Kills podcast. We give victims the right to say. Yep. So, yeah, you want to understand crime because we've we've got this thirst in this country, and I get the sense in America too, and a lot of other um, uh, countries, this thirst for crime. They want those true crime stories mm. and all that. I'm happy to provide them without glorifying crime. But if you want to understand crime, this is the world of crime. Mm. You have victims, you have suspects, you have police, you have the courts. It's multi-layered. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's the one thing I get most negative feedback, shall I say, about yeah. my show is, you know, what about the victims? You know, you're talking to people who have been, you know, I mean, 100% of the people I talk to have been found guilty of crimes. Yeah. Um, so there are victims. And I say, I know they're victims and I understand that. And there is plenty of platforms that allow victims to speak. And it's not, I don't allow victims to speak, but I don't actively go up and ring someone and say, hey, look, I know your relative was killed in this awful way uh, and it's probably really distressing, but I'm interviewing the person that apparently killed them. Do you want to talk? Yeah. I mean, that's just throwing it in their face and, you know, I don't want to do that. I actually recently had um, a brother of a guy we spoke about who was killed by yeah. uh, his wife uh, and I've interviewed the wife who said she didn't do it uh, and he's contacted me and said, hey, I've listened to the story yeah. um, and I would like to have a say. I'm yep. saying, absolutely okay. 110,000% you are coming on. Yeah. I'd love to hear your opinion. Um, and, and so I'm not saying I don't want to hear from the victims, but I'm saying I'm not actively seeking them out. Yeah. If they come to me and say, hey, I want to have my say, 110%. My thing is, there is, you always hear from victims of, as you should. Yeah. You always hear from prosecutors. You always hear from judges, from cops. Yeah. But you don't hear the other side and it's not always black and white. You know, yeah. I mean, people think that because someone is in prison, they, they, they are, well, and this is how I thought. If you're in prison, you did something wrong, you're a bad person, that's where you belong. Well, you think all the safeguards are in place. <coughs> absolutely. If, if the courts have ruled that the courts won't make a mistake, they're infallible. Totally. Absolutely. Like if a, if a cop is getting up and saying that's what happened, that's what happened. Yeah. But it's just not always the case. Obviously, there's good and bad with every profession. There's good and bad with journalists. There's good and bad with cops, everything. Um, but I think that, you know, when it comes to judges and cops and prosecutors, they should be ha held at a higher standard yeah. because they have so much power. Um, but, so I suppose, you know, me talking to these people in prisons is about giving them the opportunity to have that voice without sounding a bit wanky. And I, I'm, I'm curious because I, I know in, um, in, in this country to get access to prisoners like you, like you do on your uh, podcast, it'd be impossible. No, oh, it, it, it is. It, it wouldn't happen. No. That you get in contact. Yeah, I, I did that series Breaking Badness and that was a lot of negotiations mm. with corrective services and a lot of things were put in, put in place yeah. before we stepped, uh, stepped through the prison gates. You pick up the phone and speak to them. Where, where, what is it about the United States that people are allowed to uh, voice from prison? Well, it's that you know, it's that First Amendment right. So we, you know, obviously we give 
America a bit of stick about the the right to bear arms and I'll, you know, I'll still give them <laughs> yeah, I mean, about absolutely, that. don't even let's not yeah. even there's another podcast yeah. in, in itself, but you know, and we always say, you know, these such like archaic things, you need to update these, but they have their First Amendment right, which is the freedom of speech, yeah, um, which means that these guys literally they can they do they call me on my mobile phone, like I'm be out at the shops and my phone will ring and I'll see a number and and I'll go oh it's a it's a prisoner and I literally pick it up and it says you know this is a call from an inmate at X of whatever correctional services and they they can just call me and that's where it comes from the First Amendment yeah well there's just freedom of speech you know wow. they can't be I mean there's <clears throat> look not every state allows me that sort of yeah. access Texas for instance as people probably would imagine is a lot more hardcore uh, and you have to be an American citizen with American driver's license and everything like that to get approved um, and people who are on death row I speak to one guy on death row but we do that in a sort of roundabout not particularly kosher way right um, but you know, other than that, the general population inmates, I speak to, you know, many people have been convicted of murders um, and they just call me from their rec room on the phones. You know, I've got a couple of inmates that call me from their mobile phones in their, in their cells. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, but you know, the legitimate way, nine, you know, nine times out of 10, they, they as I said, first amendment, freedom of speech. Whereas in, in Australia, I have, cause people, my listeners always say, oh, we want to hear from Australians. So I looked into it. Um, and, you know, I looked into Queensland because that's where I'm from. And, and it specifically says that, you know, any interviews with inmates obviously has to be approved by the highest levels. Yeah. And if it's pertaining to innocence, big no. no. You're not talking. You know, okay. it, it, basically you can only talk to an inmate if it's painting the facility in a positive light. And there's not many inmates that are going to say, <laughs> God, this, this place is great. I just They're wanna, changing lives. <laughs> I, I just want to phone up and thank the people. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. The only time I've heard a... <clears throat> uh, prisoner that uh, I've been involved with and the rest um, making a jail a call that mm. it was a uh, it was a, a particularly nasty uh, a nasty crime a child was abducted mm. and this person was uh, arrested in an Asian country and uh, a, a long-winded investigation and we managed to track this person down with the child and got the child back safe safely and the person was arrested to be extradited back to uh, New South Wales and uh, he managed to get a phone from uh, in the cells and phoned one of our shock jocks on morning radio complaining about the police investigation, <laughs> calling from his cell. I'm <laughs> driving to work, just enjoying myself. <laughs> oh, that, that was a nice... And then... Uh, this, uh, what, what on earth going on? What? Yeah. Where, but that was just... He got access to illegally, like a, a, yeah. a prison phone, and thought, oh, I'll, uh, I'll phone uh, one of the shock jocks in Sydney on the morning radio. Uh, I mean, I speak to a guy who's in a Panamanian prison. <clears throat> you know, for, what, what is that? Is well, that Wild, Wild Bill? That's Wild we're, Bill. We're going to, I just said, uh, pre warn or not pre warn, <laughs> get, get you excited. We're going to talk about Wild Bill yeah. because a contract killer. But I listened to that podcast that, that you did with him, and I don't know, it, 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 it played with my mind. Like you kill people for a living and you're talking so eloquently. And he's, a, he's, he's one hell of a, an interesting human being, that's yeah. for sure. So, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, say, we'll <clears> say, <throat> yeah. save that. And we've got ahead of ourselves, but there is so much to talk about. How did you find your way into podcasting? Uh, so I spent 15 years working on the radio here in Australia, um, kind of all over the news. So working on shows like um, Husey and Kate with Dave Hughes and Kate Landbrook. Yep. And I finished up in Sydney with uh, Today FM with Erin, Molan, uh, Husey and Ed Cavalier. Um And after 15 years, I was, <clears throat> I'd kind of done everything that I was going to do, I think. Yep. Um, and I was sort of looking for a way out. I probably overstayed my welcome for a couple of years, but that was purely me just going, what else am I going to do? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I left school at 16. I have no qualifications whatsoever. <clears throat> um, so, so yeah, I, I started making, I was like, well, maybe I can do a podcast. Everyone's got a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I'll give it a go. Uh, and I started making a completely different podcast about, um, this thing called the lottery curse, this notion that people who win big in the lottery have terrible things happen to them. Oh, that, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, it was, yeah. It's incredible. But the trouble is I found that, you know, funnily enough, people who win a lot of money and then lose it in horrendous ways don't generally want to shout about it from the rooftops so I was struggling big time and I sort of made a pilot episode and it was terrible but well, part of one of the stories was I found the story about um, this guy called Abraham Lee Shakespeare who'd won the lottery in Florida yep. and only just about a year and a bit after winning he was found deceased and he'd been murdered and this woman Doris Moore had been arrested tried and convicted for his murder but had always claimed she was innocent of the crime so I was like, oh, that'll make an interesting couple of episodes for my lottery podcast. You know, yep. what can go wrong? So I wrote her a letter, literally pen to paper, mailed it off saying, hey, would you be interested in telling your story? The, the sort of letter came back and said, yeah, I'd love to. So we started chatting on the phone and I started recording a story and it was so convoluted and confusing. And I sort of said to her, look, you know, tell me more. And, and then she goes, hey, would you like to speak to my law clerk? She's helping me get back into court. 
I was like, fantastic, a legal expert who, mm. you know, you know, obviously Doris Moore lives and breathes this story and she goes off on tangents yeah. and I'm getting confused. So a legal person will just stay on track. I said, great, give me a number. I'll give her a call. And she goes, oh no, I can arrange it from here. I said, oh, what do you mean? She goes, she's in prison with me. <laughs> and I, I, my mind just went, boom. I was, like, I was like, well, yes, I need to speak to this lady. And so that was Kimberly Boone, who's our second lady we speak to on the show. And I sort of said to her, look, I know it's talking about Doris's story, but can you just tell me a bit about your story before we get stuck in? And she goes, yeah, you know, I've been, a, <clears throat> I was a, a arrested um, and, and tried for attempted murder on my husband, not once, but twice. First time I was accused of shooting him. She was acquitted of that. But Accidents then she was, happen. Yeah. And then she was retried for setting fire to the house with him inside it. <laughs> and I was just like, again, mind just going bang. And then, so then content brain in my head, you know, thank you radio for, for teaching me about content. And I just went, this is this is yeah, this story. is this is the podcast. So yeah. I went back to Doris and I said, I'm going to tell Kim's story as well, and this is my new direction. I'm, I want to tell your stories from from inside the prison. I said, Do you think you'll have anyone else that would want to speak to me? She's like, Oh, I'm sure I can find someone. <laughs> and so she went off like my in prison producer and was just like knocking on cell doors, going, Hey, I'm talking to this guy in Australia. Yeah. When do you want to talk to him? Coming to you. And it just snowballed from there. And you know, I, I did a couple of TikToks that went crazy, and then I had people contacting me saying, Hey, would you talk to my father? Would you talk to my son? And yeah, that's it. It just snowballed. And, Isn't and that was funny it. How, how it evolves? <clears throat> yeah, it, it, literally, you know, I mean, a lot of people, you know, because, you know, the podcast is thankfully done okay. And people will say, oh, you know, you're so lucky. I'm like, I am. Because yeah. it literally was just luck. But uh, you you thought the concept too, or started, <clears throat> but the concept <clears throat> sort of fe fell to you after yeah. that. But just winding it back on the lottery winners, mm. uh, it, it didn't it didn't take off along those. But I spent, did you find a lot of people that won money and then uh, their life went oh, to shit so after many, that? You would be, and this is the thing, because I was working on the Husey and Kate show in Melbourne at the time on the drive show. And part of my job, I anchored the show, but I also had to find content. So every day yeah. you're looking for news stories. And I just came across this news story. I think someone had won a huge amount of money in Australia or something ridiculous, 100 million or something. And there was this sort of headline that said like 90% of people who win the lottery within 12 months have got no money left, no friends and no family. I'm like, There's, that's not possible. It's the dream. So I started Googling and I was like, all these stories of people had horrendous things happen to them. You know, guys in the UK had won ridiculous money and just blown it all in like six months. And... So what, I was like, <coughs> what, what, what happens? Do they become well, they, greedy or just... Well, this is the thing. I think most, a lot of people who tend to win lottery, and I, well, I don't want to, you know, sort of point fingers, but I mean, they've never obviously had that much money in their life. Yeah, so it's handed they, to them. Exactly. So, and all of a sudden they don't know what to do with it apart from, well, spend it and have fun. Um, and it was quite funny because I interviewed this lottery lawyer in the United States for the podcast. And, um, he's like, you know, you need to get a good team behind you, you know, someone who's, you can trust. Funny thing was about two years later, my wife goes, didn't you speak to a guy in America called the lottery lawyer? I said, yeah. He goes, She's, he's just been in, indicted by the FBI for stealing his client's money. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and he was working with the mafia. Yeah. So someone you can trust yeah, with a exactly. hundred million dollars. You give it here. And yeah, you exactly. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. That's, it's incredible. Uh, so if anyone wants to steal that contract, Concept, go for it because I spent four years trying to put that podcast together and never. And never watch came out together. if you've, you've got those yeah. uh, winning uh, lotto numbers. Careful, get a good get a good team behind you. Yeah, someone someone <laughs> to look after your interests. <laughs> yeah. We could possibly do that. No, absolutely. <laughs> I'm more than happy to marry someone's money for them. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, okay, let's let's talk about. There's a couple of things that uh, we we want to uh, discuss. The interview room in. United States compared to the interview. Well, this room. is where I want your yeah your yeah, insights. Yeah. Absolutely. So let, let, let's have a conversation about that because they're vastly different. Even though there, there's certain aspects of it that I uh, yeah can see parallel what we do in the interview room in Australia, and then mm. I see a lot of stuff that comes from America. There are some uh, differences about the the way it's <coughs> approached. Well, yeah. I mean, look, in America, I mean, I, I watch a lot of crime shows because it's obviously in this world. And, yeah. and, you know, I watch a lot of, you know, there's a show in the UK called 24 Hours of Police Custody and that sort of stuff. And you watch the interviews. Mm. And I find that infuriating because you just get this criminal just sitting there with their heads in their hands, looking at the ground, going, no comment, no comment. And I'm like, as a cop, that just must be infuriating. Yeah. Whereas in the United States, they just seem to spill their guts. But it's the police in the UK, in, sorry, in America, they just, they can lie. Which I find incredible. I, I, yeah, and I'm, I've evolved into a better person now, but I, I've always thought that, uh, 
Yeah, if we had the power to lie in the interview room, you could virtually get a confession out of anyone. And they do. Yeah, yeah. they do all the time. Like false confessions, and people still don't believe this is a thing, but false confessions happen so often yeah. because of the techniques used by cops. Yeah. There's a, a specific technique called the read technique. Yeah, I, I was <coughs> looking at that, and mm. just the, the way it's described is it's a technique known for creating a high-pressure environment mm-hmm. for the interviewee, followed by sympathy and offers of understanding and yeah. help, but only if a confession is forthcoming. <laughs> Since it spread in the 1970s, it's been widely utilised by police departments in the United States. I like it. Um, but you know the incredible pressure? thing about that? You know <laughs> yeah. the incredible thing about that? The guy who sort of coined this whole thing, Reed, I don't know his full name, but his last name yeah. is Reed. In the sort of first time, he helped get a confession out of a, of a guy for a murder on his wife. Yeah. Uh, and the guy confessed he was sent to prison. That conviction was later overturned because it was seen to be false and they'd actually done some investigation. Yeah. He was given a half a million dollars um, as a, you know, sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, and But they still went with this, this still, technique just took off. Still went with you it. Know, and that was the first sort of notation of this, this technique being used. And it elicited a false confession. Well, look, and we'll talk about the interview room because it's not a place for the faint-hearted. No. Like I, I talk from a detective's point of view, and well, I can talk from a criminal's point of view too because mm. I've been, been on, on the, the other, other side, side, yeah. side of the table. But um, yeah, it's not a place for the faint-hearted, and and like people might think, oh, p- people just confess, and you know, it, it's all easy. When you're investigating a murder. You haven't got a lot to lot to sell the person. Like if you're the suspect, like well, if you actually tell me the tr- truth, what happened? You're going to jail for the rest of your life. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's not in your best yeah, interest. It's, but it's not like one. you've got a nice house to sell. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, not. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I try this new car. This yeah, yeah. is our latest model. You'll yeah. find it's a great car. You haven't got a lot lot to sell. Yeah. What I do find, just uh, generally, sometimes confessions would come because people hold guilt. Yeah. Now that sounds strange. Like mm. you know, if you've killed someone, how could you hold hold guilt? You're a, you're a murderer. Murderers don't have guilt. I can assure you they do. Quite mm. often, murders happen whether it's a crime of passion or some stupid thing that's escalated <coughs> to to a point. Not making excuses for taking someone's life. It's a horrendous crime. Mm. But I would often see, and I, I say to people this. Think of the worst thing that you've done. I'm not going to ask you. Ask you. Please don't. This, this would be interesting. Yeah, I'll yeah. create sympathy, pressure, yeah, then yeah, sympathy. Yeah, absolutely. Think of the worst thing you've done and how good you feel. Like we've all done things that we're, we're not proud of or ashamed of, but yep. how the pressure comes off when you tell your best friend or you tell your partner mm. or, or some someone. You yep. share share that, that guilt, that responsibility, that that stuff up. Why do you think therapy is so popular? It, well, yeah. Because you're just getting it off your chest. Getting it off your chest. <clears throat> and quite often in the interview room, I can see people just, they want to unburden themselves. Mm. They've been hanging on to this secret and it's the worst possible secret you could have. Most of my career was homicide. So I'm talking, yeah, you know, you've murdered someone. Mm. I just can't stand the stand the, the guilt, the pressure, the shame. I just got to tell you what what's happened. Mm. That, that often, <clears throat> often leads to a confession. But what I find particularly interesting in the uh, American interview room that you can make an untrue representation. Yeah. One of the cornerstones of our interviews are you, you, you can't uh, threat promise or inducement. So promise or inducement, you can't lie to someone in there. I can't say, hey, Jack, I know you've broken into uh, the house here because we've got your fingerprints on the safe in the house. <clears throat> mm. And you go, oh, shit, I thought I wore gloves. Yeah. Maybe it didn't <laughs> it yeah. didn't work. And you yeah. go, oh, you've got me. Mm. And then I sit there laughing going, ah, oh, tricked didn't, you. But, thanks. but anyway, <laughs> yeah. thanks for telling me. Yeah. <clears throat> you, can, you can't do that. In America, my understanding is that you, you can go down that path. Absolutely. And it happens all the time, but to, you know, to extremes where, you know, they use, they love the polygraph over there, you know, putting someone on a lie detector. It's inadmissible in court. It cannot be used in court, yeah. um, but they still do it because it adds pressure and, you know, gets someone tense and all the rest of it. And then, and you know, they, they even lie about the results of that. You know, there's, you can watch it. I mean, there's you know, the, the yeah. Netflix documentary I told you about, yeah. the um, American Nightmare. They put this guy on a polygraph and an FBI agent says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure you failed that. And the yeah. guy's like, what? And then they start to doubt themselves. But also what they do is they, they, they keep them in interrogation rooms for hours, yeah. like, like, you know, hours and hours, 10, 12 yeah. hours without sleep, food, drink, no rest, lights on, you know, putting them in that uncomfortable. So, so they get to the point where they're so tired, they just want it to stop. Yeah. And that's when people generally give up confessions that aren't real. They're just like, you know what? And I hear this so much. It's like, I just told them what they wanted to hear because I'm like, you know what? This didn't happen. So I know that come court time or once the investigation is over, they'll yeah. look at this and go, oh, hold on a second. That can't be true because that's 
he's, he said this and that's not what happened. And, and they even manipulate. If they don't get the answer that they need, yeah. they'll, they, ch- they change it around. They're like, well, you know, are you sure that's what happened? Do you think this is maybe more they're, what happened? They're basically telling them <clears throat> yeah, exactly. what's happened. Because a lot of the time you find, and I say a lot of the time, I, I, you know, I, I, there is fantastic cops in, yeah. in America. I'm not attacking Americans in the system, but there is a lot of bad stuff. Um, you know, and they'll find their suspect. Yeah. And I'd love to see, you know, hear your opinion on this because, you know, detectives seem to, you know, find their suspect and then try and fit a crime around because they're yeah. like, that is definitely that. This person definitely did it. How can we fit the evidence around them? And they get this detective, their tunnel vision. Yes. So they're not looking for any other evidence. They're just going, right, here's our guy. How do we fit this yeah. around that person? I, I learned, uh, <clears throat> it is an interesting topic, and I, I learned a big lesson very early in my career as a uh, detective, and uh, it was one of the first cases I, I worked as a homicide uh, detective. An elderly lady was um, uh, sexually assaulted and murdered in a home. It was a, it was a brutal crime, horrible crime. I won't uh, I, I won't na- name the victim, but I'll talk the, the circumstances of, of the crime. We get called in um, to investigate the homicide. You do a canvas. There's witnesses, and uh, there's a witness that saw someone running from the uh, running from the scene. So obviously that that's a line of inquiry. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> we tracked that person down. We got him into the interview room, and uh, he was a little bit of a, a strange type of character, early twenties, and. Uh, he said, yes, I was walking past the house around the, we couldn't put the exact time the murder happened, but it was within a 12 hour period. Yeah. I was walking uh, past the house at let's say six o'clock at night. I had my dog and just as I was walking past the house, my dog got off the lead and I was chasing, chasing my dog. Okay. That doesn't quite sound right. Is there anything else? And yeah, we, we, he was a, a person of interest. He wasn't a red hot suspect at that stage. Mm. He's gone... Yes, when I, I saw the house, I saw someone coming out of the house and they had a stud earring on and he described the stud earring in detail, oh, yeah, that okay. just walking out, in detail from here, 30, 40 yeah. metres away, yeah. a, across the other side of the road. So we know he's making this up. This mm. is not, not right. So we dig a little bit <clears> deeper <throat> into this uh, this person. The lady was a member of the church and uh, uh, he attended the same church that uh, she attended. Okay, there's a connection there, a potential connection with the victim, which is the type of line of inquiry that you follow. Then it, it got to, uh, oh, that's right. We couldn't understand how the offender got access into the premises because there was no forced entry. And it looked like there was it, the offender was let in. Why would, this lady was very cautious, why would she let someone into the house that she didn't know? So we looked at people that she, she might have <coughs> might have known that she would let into the house. While we're looking at this person, this is over a period of a, a couple of months, while we're looking at this person, we get a report of a lady uh, got her door knocked and it was him asking for a glass of water. This was a couple of streets away from where this other lady was murdered. And we're thinking, okay, we look at his criminal history. He's got history in another state for sexually assaulting uh, an elderly, elderly woman. What more red flags do you need? Mm. We have got this person lined up. I'm I'm <coughs> junior on the case, but the person I was working with is a very experienced detective and yeah, one that I, I rated. And we're sitting talking about it, going, "Well, it has to be him. We'll keep him under surveillance." Blah blah blah. We're gonna we'll get him in. And this is just at the start of DNA. We hadn't had um I I hadn't been involved. It was one of the early um, cases involving DNA in mm. uh, in this country or in uh, in New South Wales. And we, we brought him in, we interviewed him, got a sample, a, a DNA, and then we sent it to the laboratories. And they come, and we're, we're dead set, so, because there was semen left at the scene. Yeah. <clears throat> we're dead set certain we've got, the, got, got the killer. We yeah. kept him, after releasing him, we kept him under 24 hour surveillance because we were worried that he might do it again. The lab comes back to us and says, um, no, it's not your man. <laughs> well, you, well, you must be wrong. Try again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Science, you idiots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out. We're yeah, the detectives. Yeah, yeah. Go away. Yeah. We don't need science in, interfering with an investigation like this. Yeah. To the point that myself and my partner, we went to the laboratories to, we want to see this for ourselves. And uh. they showed us this big chart that we didn't fully yeah. understand <laughs> anyway. But we, oh, yeah, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Walk out. They seem fairly confident it's not him. Um, it, it wasn't him. It turned out it was another person that uh, was living nearby, stalking the place, and we, we actually caught the a- actual killer. The Our first person of interest 
He was also, and this is something I didn't say, he was also walking around the area around the railway station and that, telling people he's a suspect for the murder. When he found, when it hit the media, that someone else had been charged with the uh, the murder, he came in and complained about me and just made a complaint about, about something. It was bizarre. But if that person, and it's a long story, but the, the points are of interest, if I didn't learn at that stage, I would have been very comfortable if that person I talked mm. about was rotting away in jail for the rest of his life. It was yep. a horrendous crime. Yep. And all the red flags were there. We did everything right. We know he was lying. We proved he was lying. It was circumstantial. It was all there. I would have felt comfortable with uh, him being in jail. Then because of the advent of DNA, mm. really, I could have been involved in putting an innocent innocent person in prison. That taught me a big lesson throughout my career. Mm. And good detectives, the detectives that I learned from, that when we talk tunnel vision, bringing it back to that, that tunnel vision, it's all right to have tunnel vision because if you're the suspect, we're going to look at you from, okay, Intently, we're, we're, yeah. we're, going to go, <clears throat> we're going to go hard on you. Mm. But you also, once you, you do that, you've also got to then check, okay, that we haven't made, made a mistake mm. here. And, and it's not just, okay, we've got enough to charge. Okay, let's have people come in and try to disprove the case theory. So I think there needs to be a scientific approach to investigations. Mm. Now, people think that the way I go about my uh, detective work, I'm, I'm passionate, I am passionate about detective work. I would always try to get a team of people that you don't get that group think. So you get people that, uh, you know, you've, you've got the detectives that are going to kick doors in. Mm -hmm. You've got the detectives that are a little bit more cautious, that type of thing. That balances out and protects against the, the thing that you're talking about, that, uh, that group think that you get tunnel vision. And then you just all pile on with your stories and, and make the narrative, uh, make the, the evidence fit your narrative or your case theory. Yeah. And I mean, I think the, I mean, obviously you talk there about how, you know, you, you go, well, this is our, we're going to focus intently on this guy, yeah. but we're going to keep other avenues open and make yeah. sure that what we found has fit. Whereas I think in a lot of cases that I see, you know, where, and the, you know, a lot of cases I deal with are sort of, you know, early nineties, the eighties. Yeah. So we're talking a long time ago, but you see how, you know, there was nothing happening. They had no suspects for six months. Then all of a sudden they saw that they, they found their, their guy. Yeah. And, you know, certain things didn't fit. Oh, well, and they came up with reasons why it couldn't fit, you know. And, and a lot of cases I deal with are heavily circumstantial. Yes. Uh, and for those who don't know what a circumstantial evidence case is, it's, there's no hard evidence, no DNA, there's no fingerprints. It's, you know, it, it, they, they say, you know, you, you can go outside and everything's wet. You can yeah. you can surmise that it was raining. So it's that sort of, you know, situation. Um, so, you know, I, I think you were, you know, you spoke to me after, uh, before we started recording about Fred Freeman. Yeah. Um, that case. But, well, let, let, <clears throat> let's, let's. I mean, you want to talk about tunnel vision and insanity. <laughs> you want to listen to the story of Fred Freeman or now he's, he's now known as Temujin Kenzu. Um, well, I, <clears throat> I was, I was listening to your podcast and I was actually at, at the gym and I stopped training because uh -huh. I was getting distracted because I was listening to what's gone on there. Tell the story because it, it just sort of blew me away. It is. It's, it's crazy. So Fred Freeman, as he was known back in 1986, the year I was born, he was, you know, is when he was uh, arrested. Um, but, uh, a, a gentleman, uh, called Scott Macklem was murdered in a car park of a, a university or school type situation. He was shot uh, and he died in the car park. Now, Temujin Kenzu, Fred Freeman at the time, he, he was arrested for this crime not long after it happened. Um, now, the only connection he had to this case was that um, Scott Macklem's partner was someone that Temujin had seen on a couple of occasions, dated a couple of times. Now, he became, Temujin became a suspect because, you know, the police weren't having any, didn't have any leads and they're trying to work out who did this. And, you know, um, the, the girl's sister said, you know, he's like, oh, tell me about, you know, who could have done this? Oh, we don't know. The girl's sister goes, well, there was that weird guy that you were dating. He was into martial arts and stuff. And they were like, yeah. right, tell us about this guy. And this was Fred Freeman. So they go looking for Fred Freeman. He's the number one suspect. They're going with the jilted lover. You know, he's a jilted lover. He's killed the new boyfriend and all this sort of stuff. The only issue was that Fred Freeman lived 400 miles away from where this crime happened in 1986. And so they went after him. They have arrested him. And he had probably half a dozen people say, well, no, he was... 400 miles away, we saw him yeah. here at this time, which was two hours after the crime had committed. They, they saw him where he was. And there was no way he could have made this journey 400 miles within the time frame for these you know people to say, no, he was here. And these were people that didn't like him. They weren't yeah. mates of his. So, so it's, it's not the, the family. <coughs> no, so, no I mean, he was at home watching neighbours. No, from, these were me. all people that weren't very keen on him because he was a bit of a big 
you know, he was, they just didn't like him. It was a bit yep. of a joke back in the day. And, but they said, no, we, he was in our karate dojo. He was in karate. Yep. Um, which was used against him in the trial because they said he was some sort of satanic weirdo who had some weird powers. Um, and so they arrested him and they said, well, okay, so he was 400 miles away, but we still reckon he did this crime. Definitely reckon he did this crime. They found a guy who said he sort of saw someone drive away from the crime, but, you know, it was quite covered up and he wasn't quite sure who, you know, if he could spot them. He said they had long facial hair and Temujin didn't. So they, you know, they actually, when he was in prison, they took away his right to shave and anything like that. So they could, he could, his beard would grow. So he looked more like the suspect. Uh, he was put in. <laughs> that is actually creating, <laughs> creating the suspect. And then he was put into a lineup where this eyewitness comes in yeah. who had also been um, hypnotized to try and help him remember, yeah. which again means it should be inadmissible completely. Yeah. That should be stricken straight away. Goes into a police lineup and Temujin says back in the day, it wasn't like behind glass or anything like that. You literally were behind a piece of cloth and you could hear people talking. And the guy goes, well, I know it's not him and I know it's not him. So I'll say that guy. And the reason he knew it wasn't him and him is because they were cops and he'd seen them around the police station. He's like, well, I know it's not those oh, guys. So no, I'm going like, to say, gonna say <laughs> this guy. But then they still had this issue of how did he get 400 miles to commit this crime and get back in time for all these witnesses to say that he was there. I mean, he was also with his girlfriend at nine o'clock in the morning when the crime actually happened, but let's not worry about her. She wasn't even asked to come to trial and, and, and give her any sort of statement, even by his defence attorney. Do you have un any understanding how frustrating people like you are, Jack, of <laughs> nitpicking the... <laughs> yeah, just... I know, these little minor details. Yeah. So they, they had this big issue of like, okay, so how did Temujin, and this comes back to the whole fitting a crime mm. around someone, how does Temujin get from where he was uh, to Escanaba, where this crime happened, 400 miles away? Well... He must have hired a plane. This is 1986. Okay, so he's hired a plane, right. So have we got any records of a plane flying in and out of the airports near the area? No. Okay, right. Do we have a pilot who said that someone maybe called up and asked how much it might cost? No. Okay, right. Okay, so how do we overcome this? Okay, so we're going to get a pilot to come in and say that, yeah, this is possible. Um, this pilot uh, suggested that, um, you know... Uh, Pilots just sit around airplane hangars cleaning their planes and we'll just take a fare if someone rocks up and says, I want to fly. Haven't, haven't you ever caught a plane Yeah, yeah, just, I, I did it today, Gary. I just said <laughs> to Jetstar, I'm just going to jump on that one. There. Yeah, go for it. Um, so, so anyway, so this was the theory that they gave. You know, again, no evidence behind this. You know, there was no discussion of, okay, well, once they landed, again, no records of flights anywhere at all. Once he landed, how did he then get from where, from that plane, say, hey, just keep the engine running. I'll be back in a minute. Excuse me, sir, what's that bag of stuff? Don't worry about it. It's fine. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Why are you wearing a balaclava? Uh, so anyway, so apparently goes off, commits this crime, comes back, gets on the plane and flies back. Let's not mention that Temujin Kenzu had not a cent to his name, couldn't afford rent, anything like that. So God knows how he's hired a plane and, you know, paid enough to keep a pilot quiet. Yeah. Anyway, still, so, so this is all presented to the jury. Um, you know, during the trial, they laid out all these weapons as well on the, on the, on the table. But it was never mentioned who these weapons belonged to. It was never, no one said anything. They were just laid out. It's a nice backdrop. Yeah, yeah, like katanas and all this ninja stuff because they played on this whole thing as, oh, he was into ninja Super stuff. Superpower. Well, actually, apparently, Temujin says that in one of the interviews where he sp they interviewed one of the ladies who said, no, he was 400 miles away. Yeah. I saw him. Apparently, this is what Temujin says, and apparently, so I haven't seen it, but he said it's all written down. It's all yeah. on paper, this interview. The police said, do you think he can teleport? Oh, Jesus. I mean, isn't yeah. that mental? Like, as, as we said, if, if it was a yeah. movie script, you go, well, this is ridiculous. No, it was fan fanciful. But yeah, so he was found guilty of this crime and sentenced to life in prison. He has now been incarcerated for 37 years and he's still in prison today where, with all this information that's come out. Now, the, the pilot who was on the stand was also the personal pilot of the prosecutor. So he was flying him around. Yeah, I, I heard that. And I think that's made me choke when I was listening to it. Like, uh, is that an appropriate uh, person I mean, to come in as a witness? Well, and then you've got, you've got the judge who was getting off of drink driving offences and speeding offences, thanks to the prosecutor, was helping him <laughs> get off his... And then you've got Temujin's defence attorney who had a drug addiction uh, and was alcoholic and used to be a prosecutor in prosecutor's, prosecutor's office, but they got rid of him because of his drug and alcohol abuse and he became a defence attorney. And he was now How? Temujin's defence attorney. He just That's stood no just, chance whatsoever. And, and just breaking down what you've said, like I, I think if, if I'm looking at a homicide, opportunity, capability and motive. So, yeah. You've, well, you've, that's, yeah, exactly. Uh, opportunity. Well, 
I quite often eliminate half the suspects we've got to start with. Oh, they weren't. They couldn't have done it because they were here. They were, yeah, <laughs> they, they weren't in the area. If they're like, not in the area, they're not in the area. You yeah. can't create the... No, uh, but you can, Gary. Oh, this is what you were missing out on all those years. You I can could, create this story. Maybe I've got to go back to some of those cases. <laughs> oh, honestly, it is, it's insane. And as you said, uh, you know, motive. Yeah. What is his motive? This jilted lover. He's, he said, he, and you hear Temujin's story. You know, I say he was a bit of a, a, a jerk back in the day. Yeah. Let's say, you know, he admits he, you know, he played the field. Like, you know, he slept around, and he had a partner who, you know, was pregnant with his child, but he was still seeing other women. Yeah. It was very, you know, he, he was. So out he had, he hasn't hasn't made a lot of friends <clears throat> out there. No, but he also him. wasn't in relationships where he was like. A jilted lover who would go and kill someone because they were now dating a girl that he'd you know, he, been on a couple of dates with. Sounds like he couldn't care less. He no, just, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. so there's no motive for killing this guy. But like, how does the system? And, <clears throat> and like, I I have problems with the judicial system, and we're going to talk about the, yeah. the courts here, courts in in America. I have a problem with it that there's an arrogance that comes about it, and they don't like been shown to be uh, no. uh, wrong. They they hate when a matter's overturned. Yep. Uh, it's it's almost like it's a personal affront to them. This is a system that's meant to be unbiased. That should be based on on facts. Once they've gone down a path, they find it very. It's like trying to turn the Titanic round. Yeah. They find it very hard to. Oh no, actually we got this wrong. Mm. And I, 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 you obviously know it in a great more depth than I do. But I got the sense that it was just falling on deaf ears. What what you've just told me, if you could put that articulately down in a, on a, a yeah an affidavit and present it to the court, you'd think the court would immediately say, let's have a look at this. But that's the thing, and that's the, the that's the thing in America. Once you are in prison, trying to get out of prison is. So difficult because because yeah. they get so many so much paper with so many people. I mean, America has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Yes, the closest to them is China with one point two million or something like that. So highest incarceration rate in the world. So you can imagine there is just people putting in stuff left, right, and center. So all the courts are doing a rubber stamping. You know, the amount of attorneys that I speak to. You know, um, there's a gentleman who's part of the uh, Michigan Innocence Clinic, um, Imran Saeed. Fan- he's such a brilliant human being, uh, and he just says, you know, you see this all the time. They don't actually read the case they yeah. just rubber stamp slide it along you know because you look at Temujin's Kenzu case it happened in 1986 mm. so you think by now they go hey looking at like things have changed this was the 80s this is completely wrong you know we're sorry and Out. And, and you would think they that don't. they would prioritize it too well but the, so recently Temujin's team sent uh, because they, all he's got left now is a pardon from the governor. Yeah, that's all he's got left in, in his arsenal. So he's exhausted. He's all exhausted the, the everything courts. else. Yep. All the other courts have just said no, stamped it, moved it aside. So he's, all he's got left is the governor. So they sent letters to the governor from two gentlemen who actually worked in the airports at the time, who've said this is just so improbable. It's Ridiculous. So the, the two airports being where the crime yeah. occurred and where he was. Yeah, where he would have had to fly out from and in from both times. So, so uh, and they've said it's just it's so yeah. it's so ridiculous that it just would never have happened. Um, but the prosecutor now of the area in which he was convicted, he has come out and spoken after this stuff was put forward, and he has said, and I quote: "If you were to look at this case today with fresh eyes, Temujin Kenzu would still be the number one suspect." Uh, how- and, I, and I'm just like, and I said to Imran Said, I said. That is terrifying. This guy is a prosecutor. He's the, the head prosecutor of this area. Yeah. And he looks at this case and believes that, you know, Temujin's the number one suspect. And he said, I guarantee you, he's never read the case. He's just being told from his predecessors. And this is what happens. He pass, says, pass they just up. pass the buck and say, hey, you'll get, you'll hear about this case. Guy's guilty or blah, 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 blah. And they go, okay, great. Comes across the desk, boom, slide it away. It's, it's just insanity. It is insanity, but it's insanity at such a high cost. Oh, like someone thirty-seven and, yeah, years. People often, you know, talk about police, and we, we deserve to be criticised, police on 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 different things. But I don't know any police officer I work with, even the hardest, just drop kicks. I don't think they'd feel comfortable putting an innocent man. And that there's that saying: it's better a hundred uh, guilty uh, people go free than uh, one, one innocent one is, man yeah, being totally. punished. And uh, <clears throat> That makes a lot of sense. Like I, I, I do understand that. You can't have a system that punishes people when they're when they're innocent. And you know, the people involved in that, like if I was if that was my case, if I was a detective on it, I'd be it'd be troubling me. If I, I heard that uh, all this information came through, it's just it's Well, the lead crazy. detective on the case, John Bounds, um, was actually, before he'd had this case, he'd actually been fired from the police because oh, right. he was found to be um, doing illegal gambling with known mobsters. 
But then he came back in. Oh, and they set such a high standard. And, <laughs> well, get, guess who helped him get back into, into his job? Temujin Kenzu's defense attorney. Oh. And now he's the lead detective on this case against, and his first murder case against Temujin Kenzu, and, and, and that's it. Game well, over. There, there you go. And, and <clears throat> I just, if you have a mistrust of a, a system, uh, it's, you wonder what. I, I tend not to look at it that if something goes wrong as full on corruption. Yeah. I, I don't see it as, we're going to do this. We know he's innocent, but yeah. let's charge him because we've got $50,000 to do this, yeah, do that, yeah. whatever. I don't think it happens so much that way. Mm -hmm. I think it happens just human failings. Yeah. Just human ego. Like saying, oh, no, it's right. The prosecutor, no, that was a conviction. I'm, I'm not going to bother with that anymore. It's, uh, it was a conviction. I, I won. I'm moving on to the next one. And I think we just lose sight of it. But you've spoken to him. And I, <coughs> listening to him on your podcast, I was surprised how measured he was. I, I yeah. would imagine, and I, I suppose there's a point in time when you just got to take stock of your situation. But I could just be imagining hanging on the cell screaming. Scream, yeah. But he, he seemed to not make, I won't say make peace, but he, no, he, he he's found still very some angry, sort of, of course, but he, he found <laughs> some sort of um, way of dealing with it. And, and they, and you know, all these, that's the sort of common theme I find with the people I speak to who I truly believe are innocent. You know, there's, um, I, I always say I try not to get my opinion and give my opinions yeah. for the listeners, but I struggle sometimes, especially with cases like Timogen Kenzie, where it's just so obvious. But, you know, I, that's the one thing I find with so many of these people I speak to who have been wronged that they aren't bitter and twisted. Although, I mean, they they aren't bitter and twisted. They they were at one point, like a, a guy I spoke to, Evaristo Salas Jr., yeah. the guy I mentioned earlier, 15-year-old, convicted of a murder he'd always said he didn't do. You know, um, he spent over 40 years in prison. And when I spoke to him, he was just, you know, his mindset. And I said to him, how are you this calm and this, you know, he, he'd studied Buddhism, which helped him. Yeah. He, he got into gangs in prison because he was 15. He needed to what survive. Else? Yeah. Spent a lot of time in the hole, a lot of time fighting. And eventually he said, you know, he was in the hole and he was angry with the world as he would be. Yep. Um, and he decided when he was in the hole, someone said, oh, you need, what, do you want me to send you some books? And he said, oh, send me, you know, something on Buddhism. And that. so yeah. he started reading and he, sort of, he said he's decided right then and there, the only person he's actually hurting is himself. That's being powerful, angry, isn't it? being angry. That's no one cares. Like the system yep. doesn't care. The prison officers don't care. The, 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 the people who put me in here don't care how I feel, I'm only hurting myself. So I have to change the way I think and I need to focus on, you know, being free one day and focusing on that I will be free one day and setting myself up to be ready for when I'm free. Yeah. And he is now free. Um, you know, I got the phone call from his sister the day he was released and it was just like, blew my mind. And I spoke to him a few weeks after he got out um, and he was already making plans to speak at schools and, you know, he's, he's a very religious man. He speaks at the churches and, you know, he talks about forgiveness and, you know, I, I find, I find that type of stuff fascinating. Oh. I, I really do. And I, I say be, better person than I am. Me too. I, I don't know how they manage to, to turn it around that way, but I I've seen it. I've seen it quite a few times where people just got so <laughs> much anger and mm -hmm. we're talking about Ken Marsloo, who's, uh, Son, he's been a guest on the podcast oh, yeah, who's, whose son was uh, um, murdered at a pizza, a pizza Hut robbery, shot with a shotgun. And Ken was so angry and he, he said that he didn't want that anger to destroy him. Mm. And he had to make a conscious decision that I'm not going to let this anger destroy me. Yeah. And uh, I, I just find it really powerful. Story, uh, stories and again, like better that. man than me because if someone killed my child, yeah. God forbid... I don't, I, w I don't know if I could come back from that, you know, and to, and to, I, as I said to you today, I said, I listened to the last episode of Breaking Badness with yeah. Ken talking about his story and how his mindset has changed on, you know, rehabilitation and prisoners. And I'm just like, what an incredible man, because, you know, and as he said, you know, there's still that anger in me, but I know that that will eat me alive and I, I need to, I, I can't let that happen. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think, you know, obviously people say to you know, me, what about the victims? And, and that's what I say, you know. It's just, it is mind blowing how someone in that position can completely change their mindset about people who are incarcerated well, when they've it, done something so awful to them. And it's interesting what you said. He, he came to the realization that no one can change the way he's looking at the world except him. Mm. And then he, he's, he's made the choice because he, he sounded very calm and zen like on the podcast. So mm. I, I thought there was going to be this angry human being, but it, it seemed very, uh, very balanced. And a, a lot of these, as I said, a lot of these men and women that I speak to, that seems to be a common theme with the ones that I truly believe uh, have been wronged, yeah. is that they actually have, I mean, they have to, they have to have a positive 
outlook. Otherwise, yeah. it would just eat them alive. Sometimes I, I look at the <clears throat> crimes, and I, I've had a discussion with a uh, criminologist, Xanthia Mallet, and uh, talking about a particular crime. I won't talk the, the exact crime, but it was fairly, well, not fairly, it was as serious as you get, uh, uh, multiple murders. Mm. Talking about whether this person's <laughs> guilty or innocent and blah, blah, blah. She made a point, and I, I, I sort of, I, I learnt, I took a bit away from that, to the point that she made. She said, "Look, Gary, I, I'm not saying whether this person is guilty or innocent. I'm saying the evidence presented to the court, because I, I was, I was arguing it from a detective's point of view, going, but look at this, look at that, look at that. Yeah, you know, all those red flags, circumstantial evidence, but mm-hmm. based on my experience on uh, working in that field, and I think it was fairly compelling." Mm. Um, that this person, the likelihood this person is, is guilty. Xanthia made the point, I might agree with you, but what I'm saying based on the evidence that's been presented to the court, this person shouldn't be convicted of these crimes. Mm. And that's not a bad way of looking at it, uh, uh, break, breaking it down. It take, takes the emotion out of it. Mm. Okay, it's what what the, uh, what the we can present to the court. What is the evidence? Mm. And, and is this uh, uh, sufficient? And the power is huge. Like what other, <laughs> you're taking someone's life away. Totally. Liter- literally. Yeah. It's uh, and it, it it shouldn't be lost. But uh, look, I think we're going to have a break now, Jack. I don't know what you do on one minute remaining, but here on uh, I Catch Killers, <laughs> we we have a break. Fine with uh, me. Okay. Only I, I know you're impressed by the studio. I, I honestly, I I don't know how I can go back. I mean, you know, for me, it's like uh, flying cattle class and then sliding up to business and going. Well, I can't go back there now. So if my wife's listening, you know, you're going to up your game, sweetheart. It because, was uh, it was a bit, a bit embarrassing having the team of photographers and. <laughs> it was insane. I mean, I'm so used to just doing this out of my kid's toy room and. I come here, it's very plush. I mean, what you're doing, something right, mate. That's this is for sure. how we roll on yeah, I Catch Killers. Absolutely. Look at the future that's ahead. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll have a break and uh, we'll come back for part two shortly. 